Hey folks, Bruce Hutchin of Hutchin Hunting. And I'm so happy to be back on the airways and I'm heading up to Alaska, actually, Bush, Alaska in the Bristol Bay area. And I'm going to be visiting with Tana, Grenda. And Tana's an interesting young lady. She's a <laughs> online health coach. Yes, you can get fit all the way from Alaska down to St. Louis, Missouri, if you so choose. And she also, with uh, a good friend of mine, Lindsay Persico, uh, does uh, fitness hunts. They just had one. Didn't you have one in June or something? Yeah, we do a uh, retreat. So we do um, women's retreats out in the bush, like a fly out. So people come in, we fly them out to the middle of nowhere, out in Bristol Bay and immerse them into the, the real Alaska experience. Uh, but I saw some airdrops of pizza. How does that work? <laughs> well, that's a fun little bonus. <laughs> you hike all day and your husband brings you pizza. <laughs> but it's an airdrop, folks. So <laughs> who knows how that pizza is going to turn out? Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, especially if you're in the bush. <laughs> yes, it's a treat. <laughs> but Hunt Fiverr, check her out on the uh, uh, shout out for Hunt Fiverr. Check her out on Instagram or whatever. And Yeah, she's and great. She's an amazing. You also said she's partnered with you or part of one of your coaches for your yeah, online she, coaching. She works for me. So she's one of my main instructors for my retreats and she's my head coach in our fitness business. So she's my right hand woman. Now, how did the two of you get together? I put an ad out for that I was hiring on my team because I had built my business and I was kind of the solo <laughs> trainer, coach, CEO of everything. And I didn't have anybody under me and I had too many clients to handle myself. And so I put an ad out for an assistant coach and Lindsay, I got like 20 applications and I just remember reading through Lindsay's never met her before. And I was like, I got to hire this girl. Cause the first thing that she said was, like her experience in the outdoors and how she had, you know, won alone the beast and skinned a moose with a rock. And I was like, I got to have this chick on my team. <laughs> if anyone <laughs> can skin a moose with a rock, she is going to be my new best friend. <laughs> so, um, yeah, she, I hired her and then we became really good friends. And so, yeah, we do a lot of adventures together now. Well, that's great. Cause I always, she puts a, she puts up these great blogs and I said, you got to write, you got to write books. Yeah. She's a great you know, writer. She, she really does because she has some insights, ladies and gentlemen, that few people have. And she's just, I'm going to use the word badass because she is, she's just mm -hmm. an incredible, oh, yeah. incredible lady. And <laughs> if you ever want to get stuck someplace in the wilderness, that's the lady. That yes, stuck that's with. why I always take her with me. <laughs> uh, but yeah, she's very wise. I, I tell her that's that's my word for her. She's wise beyond her years, and everything she says is so profound. You know, she'll just throw all these one liners. I'm just like, where did where did that come from? <laughs> well, that's her brain. You know, I mean, yeah. that's that's just her brain. That's how she's wired, and yeah, you know, she's just amazing. Now, living. Out there in Bristol Bay, you're married. You married uh, a gentleman. You that was he doing the air traffic control in Anchorage also, or was he just a no, pilot? He, yeah, he's a pilot out in fishing lodges and doing the remote flying stuff. So you met him, had a couple of kids. We adopted five kids. Good for you. Mm -hmm. Wow. Here. Mm -hmm. That says. That says a lot. Yeah. Yeah, we came out here, saw a big need, opened up our home for one. We were licensed for one, and they called us and said, hey, we have a sibling group of five. We don't want to split up. And we're like, okay. <laughs> we always wanted a big family, so we just said yes. And basically went from zero kids to five kids pretty well, much overnight, and we are just thrown into the fire. <laughs> And uh, then we ended up adopting them almost three years later. So now, did the kids hunt and fish also? Yeah, we we've taught them. 
they didn't know how to do that previously. They came from a remote village, you know, like West, out in what, way Western Alaska. And so they didn't have, surprisingly, a lot of exposure to hunting and fishing, even though they came from like a native cultural community. So we've taught them how to fish, how to hunt. My daughter just shot a 73 inch moose. She's 15. No Um, way. (laughs) Yeah. She, so yeah, our kids have killed caribou and bears and they're, they're great little hunters. Now on the moose, one shot and down. (laughs) Um, one shot, it was down. Then she, this is her first moose hunt ever. She walked up to it two yards away and it was still kicking and she finished him off at two yards. Good for her. With a lollipop in her mouth. Just Hey, you got to have that sugar, right? You got to have that sugar. Yeah, she was so calm. I was really impressed. (laughs) Now, we both know how big moose are. Yeah. What did she do? How much help did she do? Uh, give you breaking it down so I wasn't with her on that one my husband took her so it was a daddy daughter hunt and she was a big help I mean she held the legs and she was right there with him the entire time as he was cutting it up and she helps cut and skin and everything but you know moose are heavy and she's 15 year old girl so she doesn't weigh that much and um So we kind of told her, you know, if you want to do a moose hunt, you need to pull your weight a little bit. You know, you're going to have to pack some meat out. We won't give you a whole quarter, but, you know, we might put 50 pounds on your back and you're going to have to pack it out and you're going to have to help every step of the way. And so my husband was a little overwhelmed because it was going to be a little over a half mile pack through swamp and creek crossings and stuff. And he's like, this is one of the biggest body mooses, moose I've ever seen because it's a really, really big, big bull like bigger than anything him or I have ever killed. And so he called me in as backup and our buddy that's a pilot. So we flew in our buddy and I and helped them pack the next day to get it all out. And I mean, she, I put 50 to 60 pounds on her back. She's maybe 110, 120 pounds. And she just did it. She was just a tough little girl and she just did it. And at one point she's like, mom, how do you how do you guys just do this so much just over and over and over? And I said, you just put one foot in front of the other. And then so, for some reason, you just keep coming back for more. That's what we do. <laughs> and uh, then by the end of it, she's like, that was pretty fun. I liked that. <laughs> so um, yeah, they're, they're good hunters. And we've got four girls and one boy. And I would say our girls are probably the biggest hunters in our family. So that's awesome. And then you're breaking down the meat and that's going to feed the family and others for a year. Yeah. We live off two moose a year, just our family, two and a half if we don't get any caribou because we just, we live so remotely, I have to ship in produce. And so I don't want to buy any meat because I have to pay a dollar a pound for whatever I ship out here grocery wise. So, um, yeah, we, you know, family of seven, we eat a lot of protein. So we live off about two and a half moose a year. And then if we end up getting a little more than that, then we share it with the community, people around us that need it. So. Now, I got to throw this in. I watched New Generation's Life of the Zero. Have you ever been a, uh, approached to be on that show? No. And I probably would say no if I was ever asked okay. to be on a show. Just because a lot of it, with reality television, it's just a lot of it's staged and like, that's not my style. I, if someone ever wanted to video our lifestyle, I'd probably say, yeah. But if they made me stage stuff, it was fake. I'd be like, no, that's, that's not real. Yeah. <laughs> and we do live a pretty crazy lifestyle, but yeah, I think a lot of it's probably. Like in st- hunting, they do a lot of B-rolls and then right. they, they finally get the hunt sequence, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and, and they yeah edit that into it. But then they always have to put drama in there. So, you know, they will stage things that didn't actually happen. Like, oh, we almost got charged by this when you didn't. <laughs> it's like that. Because I know people have been on those shows. Well, it's TV. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. You have to make it interesting and you have to have the drama. So for that reason alone, I'd probably say no. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do in the winter time? We trap. It's a lot of trapping. How big, How I shouldn't say how big, how long is your trap line? Oh gosh. Well, we do it with our airplane on skis. 
And so it's a little different than maybe having a trap line with the snowmobile or snow machine, as we call them up here. Um, our trap line alone is probably 150 miles or longer, just because we do it via airplane. And you can run that during the day, just one day? Um, It depends on the weather and it depends on the daylight. So in the wintertime, we maybe only get five to six hours of daylight. And so if we can't, you know, if a lot of our traps are full and it takes a while to, you know, get, we catch a lot of wolverines primarily, we get the wolverines out. By the time you reset the traps and everything, you might not get to all of them in a day. Um, but when the weather's good, you go and, you know, dawn till dusk. So it's are, fun. Are you trapping wolves also or just wolverines yeah. targets? Yeah. Yeah. We snare wolves. Mm-hmm. Now, is that with a foot snare or is that with a neck snare <clears throat> the neck snare yeah mm-hmm. so they're coming in for the bait yep so you're on a bait station you're in snares around it and then they don't always go into the bait but they circle around it because they're curious you know and so that's when you hope to to catch them is when they're circling the bait with the pack and then if you can catch some of the alphas and the other ones aren't as smart and they'll just kind of go into a frenzy and hopefully get snagged on one. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's fun. Like wolves are probably my favorite thing to hunt and trap and, you know, predators. <laughs> I like predators. Well, like I said, I was able on a goat hunt up in BC. We had a day, a slough day and the guy goes, want to go see if we can call wolves maybe shoot one i go yeah let's let's go yeah (laughs) and it doesn't as you know it's one of the hardest trophies for a hunter to get yeah it is i think that's why i like hunting them because not everybody has hunted and killed killed wolves you know a lot of people go out and shoot deer but how many people go out and shoot a wolf (laughs) or or snare a wolf or trap a wolf or whatever or even see them yeah or even see them they're so tough to see they're tough to hunt they're incredibly smart and you know i'd say one of the toughest animals to outsmart so now up where you are do you have um brown bears or grizzly bears inland grizzlies or tell me about the bears you have in the area yeah we have the highest population of brown bears where we live so like we get them through our yard all the time which isn't great because i have five kids that play outside a lot and so yeah we have we aren't inland enough for them to be considered grizzly bears but we have the largest brown bears in the world and the highest population of them so we're just surrounded i i joke with people like there are rats around here (laughs) because there are so many and i mean i had one this year break into my greenhouse break my windows climb in for what i don't know then it tried to get into our chicken coop which it was unsuccessful because my husband built it pretty sturdy then it ate the bushes in my front lawn. Then it broke into our suburban, broke the front passenger window, climbed in, tore up all the seats, ate the visors. I mean, they're just problem bears <laughs> when they're so in town. What do, do they come and trap them, live trap them? No, no, they don't trap. But we have a town bear tag, so everyone can get one town bear tag per regulatory year. And... So you can technically shoot them if you see them, but it was always like, well, I was sleeping or, you know, it's pitch dark outside and you can't use artificial light. So yeah, I just never connected or saw him. He's just a problem bear. It <laughs> was smart. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yep. Now Kodiak bears, are they bigger than the bears you have? Their heads are bigger. So they, they'll they have bigger skulls, but body wise, no. Okay. So you're talking <clears throat> thousand pound probably more brown bear more yeah two thousand average average a thousand but a big one probably 1500 i don't know i've never weighed them but um yeah like big bears out here squared out like nose to tail 10 feet is like a record big big bear right 28 inch skull is you know record for boone and crockett or getting in the record books um and i would say kodiak they have bigger skulls there so you might if you kill a really big 10 foot bear you might get a 20 
there, you might get a 28 to 28 and a half inch skull. So, you know, they're both pretty similar size, but. Now, are you guys just... doing any guiding at all? Do you take no. just family and friends? Yeah, no guiding, nothing for hire. We just do it for fun. <laughs> yeah, family and friends and yep. that type of thing. Yep. Yeah, we love it. I've I've tried to talk my husband into being a transporter or something because he's he's an amazing hunter. He's an amazing pilot. He's really good at what he does. And he's just like, nah, just it would ruin it for me. <laughs> I just like to do it. <laughs> so what do you guys, you have your online business. What does he do? for groceries and fuel so he used to I, i'm pretty much the main <laughs> provider right now with my business he's more of the he likes to hunt and trap and you know helps with the kids and stuff but he actually sells a lot of his furs so trapping is one thing that he does to sustain he's kind of his own doing his own thing and then um he collects sheds and he sells those so he just kind of does some random stuff and he'll do like some contracted flying jobs. He used to be a pilot for the park service for the government. He just hated working for the government. Didn't like the whole nine to five, wanted to do his own thing. So now he's like a full-time trapper hunter, <laughs> shed hunter, and, you know, sells a lot of his stuff. And then I run my business and that's how we, that's how we, you know, support our family and buy our gas. So prices of uh, Wolverines, is that pretty high or? Yeah, his that he sells because he gets some really prime ones um, for a good hide, fully taxidermy product, like eight hundred to a thousand, depending on the size. Okay, seven hundred to a thousand for a hide, and then a really good wolf, probably seven hundred to a thousand again, depending on the size of the wolf, how prime the hide is. Is that a rare one? You know, is it a black one? Black ones might go for more. Um, People really like black wolf hides, <laughs> but you know, if it's a gray wolf, 700 to 1,000 is probably the average. That pays for his fuel. He probably pays his fuel oh, yeah. every year. Yeah. I told him if you can at least break even, we're doing good. <laughs> well, you think you're going to like make money trapping? You don't. <laughs> no, no, but it just funds the hobby. <laughs> you've chosen to be where you are. Yeah. And yeah. If you can sustain price. that life. Like I said in my, you know, my note to you, some people dream about, oh, I want to do this. But one, you got to be resourceful. Two, mm -hmm. you got to be tough as heck because yeah. the winters are long and the storms are mighty. Yeah. You know, it, 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 it takes a special mentality um, to do what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. It takes sacrifice. And I was telling somebody last week that, you know, we came up here with hardly a dime in our pocket and we had basically worked in the oil field to get enough money to put a down payment on a super cup we didn't own anything else we didn't have a dollar to our name in fact we were in both in debt from college loans <laughs> and uh we just put every penny we had into a down payment on a super cub and we moved out here with a super cub and nothing <laughs> and and we like built from there and for us it was you know it was more important to live this lifestyle and have the freedom and the experiences that we do than living somewhere that we can make a lot of money, you know, and it's a hundred percent worth it. Like at the end of the day, if you're not doing anything with your money, what's the point? <laughs> so uh, we definitely, I would say, get to have world-class experiences almost monthly where we live and with what we do. And we're definitely. Have you blessed. ever thought about doing podcasts yourself? Um, yeah, we kind of do. We have a hunting podcast, but we haven't been consistent with it because it's really time consuming. And, you know, we're in the phase of life with five young kids that we just don't have time, you know, between me running my business and my five kids, I, I don't have much time. <laughs> so, But even the video logs or blogs with the yeah. column now, you know, just doing that and yeah. wrapping that into your business mm -hmm. and, and showing them how they can be fit exactly where, where they are mm -hmm. downtown new york city but if yep. you do x y and z this is going to make you more fit than going to lifetime or crunch germ or mm -hmm. any of these plus yeah. your diet mm -hmm. yeah nutrition is super important and yeah you know i thought about that i think if i ever did something like that i would do it in a video format and put it on youtube 
because I'm a very like visual person um, versus just audio. And so I've considered that, you know, a lot of people say, oh man, you guys would make a, you know, really cool TV show. But again, the, the TV shows have to have drama and everything. And I would just like show like the real raw stuff that we do. And we do with our hunts, like my brothers in my family run a hunting YouTube channel called Stuck in the Rut. Yeah, I and saw that run. from out of Idaho, right? Yeah, now it's Alaska too. So you know, we film our hunts and my brothers film their hunts. And then we kind of give my brother all the footage and he edits them and puts them on YouTube. And that's also a hobby. But we've done that for, you know, 13, 14 years now. And they've grown that YouTube channel. But it's just a lot of work, you know, <laughs> no, like really. for me, I, I love to be disconnected and, you know, it's hard enough to run a social media and keep up with all the online stuff. I'm like, man, sometimes I just want to run away and live in a cabin out of cell service, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, I understand. <laughs> I wish I lived back in like the fifties and just could enjoy like what Alaska was like back then. Totally untouched. Yeah. My um, wife says that about me. She said you were born way too soon yeah <laughs> or too late way too yeah. late but Same. then in Feel the that. wild wild west the life expectancy 30 40 years old maybe yeah <laughs> maybe so there you go yeah, they live the life there's <laughs> a blessing and a curse you know absolutely that. yeah now yeah. let's switch it up to you i asked you to give uh me three concerns about our the future our hunting tradition and the first one is shutting down fed, federal lands to make the land not accessible for the people that actually own it let's talk yeah. about that a little bit yeah you know i think it's just overall a an agenda for you know our country to shut down as much land you know, like public land as possible and take away access. And I think that's just a hidden agenda from everything. I mean, you look at what's happening in Colorado and they are wanting to reintroduce wolves in that area and then shut down predator hunting for, you know, mountain lions and bears and stuff. And it's like, man, they're going to destroy the ungulate herds for one, but for two, that's going to shut down a lot of hunting opportunity that we've enjoyed for many many years and passed down to generations and in alaska the same thing is happening you know alaska is such vast country and it's a huge state right and there's only one main road system that goes through it and a majority of alaska is federal lands and they're starting to shut all those federal lands down to hunting for whatever reason i don't know who's in charge of that it's kind of a mixture between like the federal government and they're just trying to shut it all down and at that point it's gonna limit us so much that we won't have the opportunities that we used to you know and it worries me for my kids like what opportunities are they gonna have when they grow up are they gonna have the same ones as mine and so as they're shutting down more and more lands you know there's over a million acres of land now that is being threatened to shut down hunt to hunting in alaska you know we gotta fight the good fight <laughs> fight for our freedoms keep it open because they take a little, they're just going to keep shutting it down and then we won't have much to hunt anymore. So one good thing you mentioned about uh, Colorado and the reintroduction of wolves. Now there was a court case that just came down saying that CPW, Colorado Parks and Wildlife could manage the wolves up until up and to uh, shooting the wolves, not just trying to scare them away or given the ranchers, you know, money for the cattle, the sheep that they lost. And so there's a little glimmer of hope uh, because I, for years, um, had friends up in Unit 2 and the wolves came down from Wyoming and were in Ir Irish Canyon. They were there way before the reintroduction. And fortunately up there, there's a huge huge influx of sheep herders so mm. they will they will just take care of business using the three s's s, <laughs> s, s, s. yeah <laughs> and we won't get into that we won't get into that if you want to know just look it up 
but <laughs> you know when yeah. when you look at your kids and what you've been able to do you know how it's important how important to you and your husband is to keep teaching your kids how to fish how to hunt i mean your daughter land sake she killed a monster moose that 90 percent of the hunters paying oogles dollars <laughs> yeah we'll never we'll never see forget it forget about shooting <laughs> they'll never see us yeah just to put it in, into perspective uh the world record alaska yukon moose scores 266 boone crockett and hers is 254 so dang i mean 12 points shy of what the world record would be 12 inches shy so she yeah absolutely i would say more like 99 percent of people may never see never never myself. 99.9999 <laughs> but it's really and they're important. paying 25 30 40 thousand dollars whatever oh, yeah. yeah but you know it's really important to us especially because we when we saw what they came from which was pretty rough background and we got the kids they were ages like two to ten and their whole native alaska native culture their yupik their whole culture is supposed to be about hunting and subsistence and fishing and living off the land right and when they came to us they had no clue how to do that they knew how to watch tv they knew how to play video games they knew how to be on phones and they knew how to like eat junk food they didn't know how to skin anything they didn't know how to process meat they didn't know how to fillet a fish and so part of it is one, keeping their culture alive for me. It's really important that I show them like, this is what your ancestors did, you know, and this is what you can continue to pass on to your kids. And it's, it's that lost culture. You know, a lot of people hold a culture card and the racist card, and I don't want to get into politics or anything, but really like what culture are we passing down? You can, you can blame the past all you want, but what culture are you passing down? And for me, I want to show them that, you know? I don't know if you can tell, but I'm white <laughs> and uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what skin color we are. I want to show them that they, this is what their culture is. And not only that, a lot of their peers now have cell phones when they're six years old, seven years old on TikTok, whatever it is. And they don't know how to go do this stuff. And for my kids, I don't allow them to have phones. I don't allow them to have access to social media, to YouTube, to anything, I send them outside and I want to show them like what their culture is. And I just think it's going to be lost. Like if we don't continue to pass that down, we're going to end up a connected generation of technology with a lot of mental health issues, period. And not know how to be outside, not know how to play, not know how to provide for ourselves. And I just think it's a, yeah, it's a culture that's going to be lost if we're not protective of it. In the Inuits, I had, fortunate that I hunted up on Gava Bay, Kudrawal, and spent time with the elders because they were in hunting camp. I mean, mm -hmm. they were yeah. there. And so you sit around and you just ask questions. And what I heard was profound because we were caribou hunting and I said, well, your ancestors have been here for thousands of years how have they been able to exist and he said very simple if the caribou come we live if the caribou don't come we die mm -hmm. yeah and then they take the caribou and that is their subsistence along mm -hmm. with fish and some trapping but mm -hmm. up in that you know area it's mostly the caribou yep. and people don't know how to do that anymore People don't yeah. know how to have conversations like you and I had had the last 30 minutes or so and talking about the things that are important to us versus what the narrative from media comes mm -hmm. out because people that reach common ground, that have common goals, and want to take care of the land and be stewards of the land are the people that will make the land whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's not a lot of connection to the land anymore. <laughs> there just isn't. And then if they continue to shut all these federal lands down and a lot of these subsistence taxes, a lot of our natives and 
people have been here forever have used for their families. They're shutting those down and now people don't have access to any caribou that they can hunt. And then we might not have moose nearby, so they don't have access to that. So what do they resort to? Okay, I have to buy my food now. And so you shut down the lands, you lose the culture, you quit passing it down, you lose the culture, <laughs> you know, and it's just, it's something I'm really passionate about to teach my kids and show them that this is what you have to continue to to pass down or it's going to be lost. Um, because I mean, they, they grew up in a village where they spoke a different language and they never learned the language. And I ask all around like elders and everything, does anyone know how to speak this language to teach my kids their, their native language? No, because it wasn't passed down. <laughs> so just like anything, we have to keep it alive. If we don't want it to get lost, we can't just expect it to continue. Um, so yeah, something I'm passionate about. I could probably talk a long time about it. <laughs> no, well, that's good for another show. And with that, right. we're, we're going to wrap up with Tana. And this is Bruce Hutchin with Hunt, Hutch on Hunting saying, welcome uh, back to my podcast, Hutch on Hunting. And I'm going to have interesting people from all around the world uh, being guests. And Tana, I look forward to having you a guest again. And we'll do well, some more you. deep dives into the culture. <laughs> of uh living in bush alaska thank you <laughs>